following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today, in this lecture, we're going to talk about a word that's used often in spirituality, which is the word soul. Unfortunately, it's used without real knowledge of what it means. So in order to clarify this concept, we will talk about it from the point of view of its ultimate potential, which in this tradition we call diamond soul. To begin, we need to understand that the word soul is not something vague, even though we use it in that way. We use soul in modern language to imply anything that has feeling, anything that is somewhat emotional. We talk about it having a quality of soul. But this point of view and interpretation of the word is completely shallow. It lacks depth of the actual meaning, where we get the word soul and why we need to understand it. Because anyone who's interested in spirituality, who's interested in liberation from suffering, needs to know what the soul is, because that is precisely what we want to liberate. It is the soul that suffers. It is the soul that needs to be born again. It is the soul that is longing for God, for divinity. To know what the soul is, is to know how to reach its perfection. If you don't know what the soul is, you cannot perfect it. You cannot awaken it. You cannot work with it. As with anything in life, if you don't know what your goal is, you can't achieve it. An engineer who needs to know, who needs to build a bridge, has that goal in mind, has a problem and knows the solution, and then applies the science and a method of work in order to accomplish that goal. And that work with the soul is no different. It is not vague. It is not up to anyone's imagination. It is not something that you can invent on your own. The soul is a specific, real thing. And to grow it, and to elaborate it, and to perfect it, is an exact science. It's not something you can invent. It isn't something that you can make up, that you can put together on a whim. Even though nowadays, people think that they can. The state of our world proves that we are wrong. In order to create soul, we need to know the science. And to most of us, this sounds strange, to create the soul. Because we all assume that we have a soul. And this is our first mistake. This is the first problem that we have in modern times, spiritually speaking. We assume, wrongly, that we already have a soul. 
you might be surprised to find that Jesus did not say that. Jesus told us, in patience, you will have your soul. He didn't say we have it already. We acquire it with patience. So in the Bible, where you find that scripture, translated in English, it says soul. But the Greek word is psyche. So this also reveals many misunderstandings that we have about the word soul. We think of the soul as something emotional, something that has my taste and my interests and has my traumas. But this is all wrong. None of that is soul. In Greek, the word for soul is psyche. Nowadays, we use this word psyche in a variety of ways. But the actual translation of the word is soul. Breath. We think of psyche as mind. And this is wrong. The soul is not the mind. The psyche is not the mind. The psyche is the soul. So this word psyche in Greek is also a figure in mythology. A beautiful maiden. If you don't know what the word maiden means in English, it means virgin. We think of maiden as someone who cleans the house. Something like that. Someone who milks the cow. No, the word maid or maiden means virgin. So Psyche, in Greek mythology, is a young girl, a virgin. And her story is a myth. It isn't literal. It teaches a truth. And this is another mistake that we make in modern times. We look at the myths and we think that our ancestors thought the myths were real. And this is as stupid as thinking that the people on Wall Street all worship a bull. Because there's a big statue of a bull there. If we go down there and we see that statue of the bull, we think, oh, all these people, they must worship this bull. They must have rituals where they make offerings to this bull. It would be stupid to think that way. But we think that way about the ancients. We're wrong. The ancients knew perfectly well that the mythological figure of Psyche represents the soul. And the story of Psyche and Eros is a story about ourselves. About our very identity, our very nature. This word Psyche is the same meaning as the Hebrew words Nefesh, Neshema, Ruach. And if you've studied Kabbalah, you know that those three words mean breath and they mean soul. And those three words are really important in the Bible. But unfortunately, the translators to English didn't know Kabbalah. And so they translated those words randomly according to their whim as soul or breath or something else without knowing the meaning. So we read in the Bible that Adam was made into a nefesh haya. The Bible just says living soul. And we read that and think, oh, Adam was made like us. Wrong. A nefesh haya is a specific type of soul. It's a very beautiful, pure soul that we don't have. We have nefesh, which means animal soul. But it is not a soul that is pure and divine like God. We have a nefesh that is not with haya, life. We have a nefesh that is in darkness. And this is proven when we look inside. We see darkness. We don't see divinity as the primordial Adam did. We lost that. We need our soul to recuperate that capacity of perceiving divine things directly. The same way that we see through our physical eyes, we should be able to see through the eyes of our soul and when you have that, you're on your way to having nefesh haya, a living soul with the force of high life. So Jesus explained that in his gospel. He said, in your patience, 
possess ye your psyche. Now this phrase occurs in the book of Luke after a very stern warning from the master Jesus in which he explained that all the things that we think are so important are going to be destroyed. The whole planet, the whole earth, all of the nations, all of our possessions, everything will be taken. And those who believe in God and hold fast to God will be the ones who pass through that experience. And they pass through that experience learning and knowing how to transform it. And the meaning is here. In your patience, possess ye your soul. And what he's giving there is a profound teaching about how to transform impressions. How to take the difficult experiences of life and use that as a way of purifying yourself and strengthening yourself. Not identifying with the world, but overcoming it. So this image of Psyche shows one scene from the story of Psyche in which she is being punished. In the top of the, the image, you see a goddess. In this case, it's the goddess of love. And the goddess, who is symbolic, not literal, is forced to punish Psyche because mankind became identified with her beauty and forgot the gods. And as a punishment, Psyche becomes a slave. Isn't that our state? Haven't we forgot divinity? And are we not now slaves? Did we not fall in love with the mind? With sentimentality? With beauty? With appearances? With materialism? And forgot divinity? forgot the beauty of divine things and became entranced with terrestrial beauty. So this is the punishment that Psyche receives. And that is not a literal story. It's a story about our state as a soul. This is reflected in the Egyptian mysteries as well. In the story of Aurus. And this next image shows the famous trinity of the Egyptian mysticism, Osiris, Horus, and Isis. These three divine archetypes are inside of us. They represent parts of ourselves. Similar amongst the Greeks, the Egyptians did not worship a man with the head of a falcon and think it was literal. They understood that these were symbols, archetypal images. What we have inside at a very high level. This image represents the highest aspect of what we can call spirit in us. Far beyond the soul. This is father, mother, child. The most ancient form of Trinity. And this represents how the abstract divinity crystallizes into manifestation and produces a child, a son, which in the Egyptian mysticism is called Horus, and in the Christian mysticism is called Jesus. It's the exact same symbol. Horus who in this sculpture is the child in the middle, is our personal inner father. We call this our innermost. In Christianity, they call this the father. In Hinduism, they call this Atman, self. Auris represents, in Kabbalah, the Sefer Hesed, which means mercy. This is our spirit. This is our divinity. This is a part of ourselves that we don't see, that we have no memory of. And because of that, 
our psyche is punished. In the Bible, this story is reflected in Adam and Eve cast out of Eden. At one time, we knew divinity, spoke with divinity, talked with divinity, but we became identified with sensation, with materialism. Because of that, we left Eden, the state of bliss. And we lost the ability to talk with God, to see God, to know God. Same story. Centuries have gone by. Eons have gone by. We find ourselves in the state that we're in. Mere animals treading the earth with a lot of questions and a lot of desires and no real answers. Seeking something because an impulse in our heart knows there is something more. Nothing satisfies us. As much as we chase our desires, we are never content. Many take that experience and make it their philosophy, their way of life, and say, we should just take as much as we can before we die. We should conquer as many as we can before we die. We should accumulate as much sensation and as much materialism as we can. That's the meaning of life. They're wrong. The meaning of life, the meaning of being here, is to return back to our Father, to our Oris, our innermost, to restore psyche, our soul, to grow it. It sounds odd, but as a fact, our innermost needs us to do it. Sounds almost treasonous to say that God needs us. If God is God, why does God need anything? But we have been created. We have been put here. We exist, and there is a purpose. But it is not a purpose that you can find in materialism or in sensations, in wealth or power. It is a purpose that you find in the depths of your heart. In those depths is the temple of your innermost. And that is the longing that calls you to spirituality, to discover that fire in the heart what it means, and how to grow it. So the quote that we have here on the side says, at the daybreak of the new cosmic day after the profound night, the sun, the triad, Horus, the divine spirit within each of us, emanates the essence, his mystic principles, from himself into the wheel of samsara with the purpose of acquiring a diamond soul. This is our purpose. We are the essence. We are the impure atom. We are psyche, enslaved. And our purpose is to become liberated from slavery, to become perfected. And this is why in the Gospels, Jesus said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We are not perfect. Many say we are made into the image of God. If God is our image, that is no God. If God is angry and lustful and pride like we are, that is not a God. That is a devil. God must be better than us. Thus, we are not in the image of God. The primordial Adam is. The archetype of our being is that, but we have not become that. The purpose is to become that. The purpose is to become a divine soul. So this quote says further, how great the joy of Oris is when acquiring a diamond soul. Then he is absorbed within his divine mother, and she is also fused with the father, who together form a unique diamond flame a God of resplendent inner beauty. This is even more astonishing to contemplate that if we as the lowly soul here mired in the suffering of the earth are to fulfill our purpose, we make of our God something greater. We, this animal that we are, the beast that we are now 
if we conquer that animal, if we liberate our purity from that impurity, we make of our God something greater and become part of that. It seems to me that's something worth fighting for. That is the purpose of being here. That is the purpose of these teachings, to help us achieve that. A diamond soul. Well, this word diamond, of course, comes from Greek adamas, which means unbreakable, unconquerable. Now you can ask yourself the question, is my psyche unconquerable? And if you think it is, you need to seriously examine yourself because it is not. We are conquered by a simple illness. We are conquered by a simple image, by an advertisement, by a commercial, by one link on a web page. We are conquered by a word, by a sound. We are very weak. A diamond soul cannot be conquered. A diamond soul is perfect. A diamond soul has no weakness. It is a pure reflector of the light. If you observe this physical diamond, you can see that it is radiant. It captures and amplifies the light. This physical diamond is an allegory of what our soul can become. It can become a magnifier, an amplifier of the light of Christ, the light of our being. Jesus is a great diamond soul. One man who has moved millions to strive towards being better. Buddha, another diamond soul, who even in his serenity and few words has moved millions towards longing for the light. Krishna, Moses, there are many. These are diamond souls. We have that capacity to become that. But what we need to realize, if that is our goal, if that is truly what we want, good. But then we need to measure the resistance. We need to fully and completely understand what that will require. Because to make a diamond is not easy. If you contemplate how the physical diamonds are made, it's truly astonishing. They are made in the depths of the earth from ancient living things that died and then were subject to enormous pressure. All the forces of the earth compressing and focusing all of their forces and energies on the black earth, the coal, the carbon. And over millions of years, this little gem can be found. So let's compare that allegory to humanity. Humanity is a black earth, very degenerated, filthy, wallowing, in all the filthiness of the mind, enjoying like animals, everything bestial. The karma is applying more and more pressure to humanity. More and more problems, more suffering, more struggle. And humanity is being compressed by the forces of nature. 
Most of us simply cry and suffer in anxiety and anguish, scrambling to try to get something out of it before we are killed. But if we can instead learn to receive those forces, in fact, to welcome them as a way, as a form of energy to transform our soul into a diamond, then we can aid the process. The next graphic shows us the tree of life, the Kabbalah. And this quote from Samael M. Vior, he states, it is clear that the monad needs something in life in order to self-realize. What is it that the monad needs? We find the answer in the light of Sanskrit. It needs Vajra Sattva, which means a diamond soul. This is a soul that has no I. So when we look at the tree of life, the Kabbalah, we have before our sight an archetypal representation of ourselves. This is not a literal map. It is not a figure to be worshipped. It is simply a map. It is an archetype, a structure, that gives us a window into understanding very subtle and deep things. We see a series of spheres, and each sphere represents a world, an aspect of mind, an aspect of soul. At the top are the most subtle, at the bottom the most dense. At the top, we find that primordial trinity in all religions. Just below that top, we find a hidden sphere called da'at, which means knowledge in Hebrew. And below that, we find a second triangle. This second triangle is what we call the monad. That's a Greek word that comes from monas, which means unity. The monad is that part of ourselves that is our spirit and soul together. When we talk about spirituality, we talk about what we can put in quotes as a real self. We're really addressing the monad, the soul and the spirit together. The union of these two is where we get the word religare, which means to reunite, to bind again. And the word yoga, which means the same thing. These are about joining together psyche, the soul, which is here in Tifereth, the causal body, back again with its divine soul, which is Geberah, and the atmic body, the innermost, which is Hesed. Those three are one in the perfect soul, in the diamond soul. But in us, they are not. They are separate. That's why we're in darkness. Our essence, what we feel in the deepest heart of our being, that subtle quality that is beyond name and face and place and time, our essence, our consciousness, is a spark, a fraction of the being that emerges from Tiferet, and descends into materialism to take a physical body, to have a heart, to have a mind. We develop a personality. We have experiences, and we forget who we are. This is why in the myth, Psyche sleeps. She doesn't know who she is. That is our state. We don't know who we are. We don't know our real name. We don't even know where we were last week. We can't even remember what we were doing a month ago. We can't remember at all where we were before we were born into this body or the body before that or the body before that. We don't know who we are. Our psyche sleeps. So this quote continues, a diamond soul is a soul that has no I, that has eliminated all the subjective elements of perception. These subjective elements are the eyes and the three traitors. What we think is ourself 
what we experience psychologically, psyche, soul, is our I, me, with my name, with my traumas, my regrets, my resentments, my desires, my pride, my lust, my anger. That is what we think is me, myself, my soul, we call it. But this is all wrong. That is all garbage that we have added, that we have created. The diamond soul has escaped all of that. Knows itself. Knows who it is. Knows God. Has become God. So what we need to understand on the tree of life is how this relates to us. The bottom sphere represents our physicality, our physical body. And just above that is the sphere of Yasad, which relates to our energy in the body. The energy that processes everything that the body does. Digestion, breathing, circulation, even memories, even imagination. That's all in the vital body. Yasod. And just above that, we see what we call the astral body, or Kamarupa, which in Kabbalah is called Hod. And this relates to our emotionality. What we experience as emotion. What we call hate and love. And envy. Desire. And next to that, we see the mental body, what in Kabbalah is called Netzach. And this is what we experience as thought. That chattering, nonstop stream of thinking is the activity of your mental body, your mind. These are like clothes. Your physical body is a suit. And what animates that suit is your vital body, your energy, your sod. And the emotions you feel while you're wearing that suit is hod, astral. And the thoughts you think are netzah, mental. But all of that, that suit, all those clothes, surround your psyche. And your psyche sleeps. This is why we go around from experience to experience, like sleepwalkers. We drive to work, but we don't remember how we got there. Or we take the bus or the train, but we can't recollect what happened on the way. Or we're at work for four hours or five hours, but we don't know what we did for those four or five hours. And we lie down to go to sleep at night, and suddenly we wake up the next morning, and we have no idea what happened during those eight or ten hours that we were asleep. Because psyche is asleep. Our soul was not there. Our body was moving around. Our energy was moving around. Our emotions were active. Our thoughts were active. But our soul was not. Our psyche was asleep. In the midst of all of that, who keeps psyche asleep? Why is psyche asleep? And who is this self that I think that I am? It is all the eyes, the desires. When we really observe ourselves, when we attempt to awaken psyche to be here and now, and to really discover what is going on with these four bodies of mine, my physical body, my vital body, emotional and mental bodies, what am I doing with them all the time? Suddenly we find out we aren't doing anything with them most of the time. Other things inside of us are running the show. And we're just not aware of it. Why do we have the job that we have? Is it our soul that wants that job? Or is it our pride? Is it our craving for money? Or our craving for attention? Our craving to be envied? Those are not the soul. Those are the I. Different eyes. And why do we chase that woman or that man? 
Is it our soul that wants to be with that person? Or is it our lust? Or our ambition? Or our fear? Who is making our choices and decisions? Is it the soul? Or is it an eye, a desire? We all love to say, well, I'm doing what my soul wants. So your soul wants you to act the way that you act? To treat yourself and others poorly? To constantly be motivated by fear and anxiety and anger and resentment? Your soul wants you to gossip? I don't think so. The soul, the nature of the soul is love, altruism, patience, serenity, joyfulness, contentment. Do we experience those things? Sure, when you get the new dress or the new watch or the new shoes, you feel happy for five minutes. But then after you want something else. So you don't get contentment from things. Or maybe your friends praise you one day and you feel happy and content. But then a few days later, you're the bad guy again. So where is your contentment? It's not real. It's not the soul. Real contentment, real happiness, real joy, real love does not depend on circumstances. They are virtues of the soul. They are there even in difficulty. So what we experience is the I. We call the I many things. We call it the ego or egos. We call it sins, defects, vices. We can say that the ego is the ego itself. We talk about it as one thing. We can call it Satan. We can talk about the ego as having three parts. We call this the three traitors, the demon of the mind, the demon of desire, and the demon of evil will. And we can talk about the ego as having seven parts, which are the seven capital sins. We can talk about it as 10, 10 unwholesome deeds. The truth is, the ego is as Jesus described it in the Bible, in his story about the possessed man who was running with pigs. Do you remember that story? All the people were scared of a man living outside of town who was always living with the pigs and he was mad. And Jesus went there and said, who are you? And he said, my name is Legion. That is our ego. It is truly Legion. We just don't care. We don't realize. But if you want to have a diamond soul, this is the main thing. Find your psyche. Wake her up. Put her to work. Eliminating that ego. That's what we're going to talk about today. So this quote continues that these three traitors are Judas, the demon of desire, who is mistakenly confused with the astral body. Pilate, the demon of the mind, who is confused with the mental body. And Caiaphas, the demon of evil will. Most of us who enter into spirituality hear about astral projection or mental projection. We hear about using the astral body for this and for that. And we may even learn techniques. What we don't realize is that 99% of those teachings are teaching us how to do that work with our own ego. We think it's the astral body. It is not. What we experience as emotionality, we call it the astral body as a kind of politeness because it is astral. It relates to that dimension, but it is not solar, meaning it did not come from God. It was not a creation of divinity. It is not golden. What we have as an astral body and mental body is animal. Easy to see if you look at our thoughts and emotions. The thoughts and emotions that we have, the impulses that we have, are animal. 
All we're concerned about is our security, eliminating threats, getting whatever we want at any cost. That's animal. And that extends into spirituality. Our behavior is not really human. So these three traitors are very much active in all of us without our awareness. What we need to understand is that they are traitors to the Christ, to our being. In order for us to reflect the light of our being, those traitors cannot be in us. The ego and the divine can never mix. In other words, what we have as a psyche is just an embryo that's been left in garbage. In order for us to become a diamond soul, we have to take that embryo and nourish it. And we have to create soul. In the same way you take a seed and you create a tree or a plant, you have to grow it. It must be made. You cannot say that a mustard seed is a mustard tree. It isn't. It is an archetype. It has the potential to become a mustard tree, but it is not that tree. In the same way, our soul is not really a soul. We have an embryo, a seed, but for it to actually be a soul, it must be grown. It must be made. And this is in the Bible, all over the place. The people don't know how to read the Bible. The main place that you find the teaching about this is the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. Jesus explains to Nicodemus very clearly, in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. But Nicodemus doesn't understand. He says, how do you enter into your mother's womb for a second time? And Jesus says, how can you be a master of Israel and not know this? How can you be a master of Kabbalah and not know this? It is one thing to be born of the flesh. It is another thing to be born of the spirit. Both come from sexual energy. To be born of the flesh is easy. All the animals do it. That is not how you make the soul. You make the soul by being born of the spirit. By learning to transform that energy in a pure way, in a divine way. By restraining it, by transforming it, by redirecting it. In this way, we give rise to the second birth. And that second birth is how Oris gains his golden body. The solar bodies. Bodies that are made from purity, not animality. In the book of Matthew, Jesus teaches about this. He says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. When the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. This is not literal. It's an allegory. It's a teaching story that explains when your king invites you to the wedding, what does that mean? What is a wedding? A wedding is a merger of souls. When two become one flesh, is that not the case? The wedding that we need is a spiritual wedding between two souls in ourselves, our divine soul and our human soul. That alchemical wedding is the marriage of Lancelot and Guinevere under the auspices of King Arthur. You see this story, how beautifully it explains this? Hidden. The king and his queen and his knight are the monad, our monad. That wedding unites them as one. 
a monos, a unity. Souls, plural, and spirit, united. That being is a Buddha, a master. Not only a, any old Buddha or any old master that you can find on the street, a resurrected master. For that perfect union to happen, it only comes through resurrection. For all these parts to be perfectly united, to be a diamond soul, to be what we call Vajra Sattva. That's what's depicted here. Vajra Sattva is an archetype in Buddhism. Vajra Sattva here represents the union of all the parts of the being in perfect harmony, resplendent. We have that inside, the potential for that. We have that archetype, and we can become it. The meaning of the story of Jesus is that this man attended the wedding, but without his wedding clothes. How will you want to be dressed at the birth of your inner God? The moment your being will become a perfect God, do you want to go there dressed in your lust and your anger and your pride and your envy and all your filthiness? Do you want to walk in there before all the gods and angels and masters who can see every atom of your being and have them see what you've been doing? Your sexual crimes, your emotional crimes, your mental crimes? Do you really want to go in to that wedding trailing garbage and stinking like a pig? That's what the story represents. I don't want that. What a horrible thing to appear before the divinities as I am now. As a human pig. I would prefer to appear there clean, pure, restored, repented. No filthiness, no stench. To have that means that not only have you cleansed the ego completely, but you have the wedding garment, the wedding clothes, clean. Those are the solar bodies. That is an astral body that is clean. It is a mental body that is clean. It is a causal body that is clean. Those must be created. Those must be developed. So this word Vajrasattva is very interesting. It's Sanskrit, of course, the first term is Vajra. And depending on which tradition uses it, it has many meanings. It means thunderbolt. It means diamond. It means something that is very hard, something that is dense, like steel or iron. It means impenetrable. It means a cross, fork, zigzag, column, or pillar. It is the weapon of Indra. In Buddhism, all the tantric Buddhists use a vajra when they perform their rituals. Vajra looks like a little sign of infinity. And it does represent that. Do you see in that sign two circles united? This is an alchemical wedding. This is man and woman united, male and female in balance, in harmony. The symbol has many deep, deep meanings. And of course, the Vajra is the weapon of Indra, which we see in this other image. This is Indra, who is the father of the gods in Hinduism. His weapon is the Vajra, a thunderbolt. And he uses that to conquer the demons. Sattva, the second part of the word Vajrasattva, means essence, embryo, fetus, energy, living being, life, nature, spirit, consciousness, mind. Again, very deep. So this term Vajrasattva has many interpretations. But in its synthesis, it is a diamond soul, a diamond mind. 
You see, sattva holds the same meanings as psyche. You see here, breath, soul, spirit. Has the same meaning as nefesh, neshema, and ruach. So to say vajra sattva is to say a lot. Now what I want to point out specifically here is how Indra is using his vajra to conquer the demons. We know, of course, that Indra is symbolic and that the demons are symbolic. And when we relate this to ourselves, we see the demons are our egos. Our lust is demonic. Our anger, demonic. Our pride, our envy, these are demons in our hearts and minds. We need our Indra, our father, to strike them with his thunderbolt. What is that? It's us. It's what we should be. We should be the warrior in the hand of God. We should be Lancelot, the knight who Arthur sends to battle. That is the one who is impenetrable, clad in armor, wielding his weapon. The armor is the solar bodies. Samael Anvior states, the, very fact, the fact that the very innermost God submits one to ordeals is certainly rare and astonishing. By all means, it stands out that the beloved one wants to be sure of that which he possesses. He needs a diamond soul. So I explained to you that our innermost is related with chesed, who's part of this monad. The human soul, which is tifret, is what descends into materialism to take a body as our essence. And that essence, our consciousness, our psyche, needs to awaken. And with the love of Eros, Cupid, develop into a perfect soul. That is a mystery of alchemy. And through that alchemical process, we need to create the soul. Once the soul is made, the solar bodies are established. That's only the beginning. Because the ego is still alive. We need that armor. We need a strong mind. We need a way of thinking that cannot be deceived by the ego. We need an emotional quality that cannot be deceived by our own desire. And we need a willpower that has the strength to overcome any challenge. This is why it's called diamond, vajra, impenetrable, hard like iron or steel. That's why. It isn't to go out and conquer the world and show the world how great we are. It is to conquer our own mind, which is much harder than conquering the world. Many have tried to conquer the world. All have failed. Some have tried to conquer the mind and succeeded. So the diamond soul is when these bodies, the solar bodies are established and then the ego is cleansed. And then all the parts of the body, the being rather, are united. This is where it creates a diamond soul. But to do that, our own innermost submits us to ordeals. And this is something that we really need to learn. If we have this goal in mind to become a diamond soul, we need to know what our psyche is and awaken it. We need to see what our ego is and start destroying it. We also need to understand that every moment that we experience in life is being managed by our being. When we face difficulties, challenges, ordeals, problems, God is giving them to us. We forget that. We moan and cry and complain to our friends and family, oh, life's so hard, I wish it wasn't like this. I don't have enough money, nobody loves me, I'm having this problem in my relationship, etc., etc." going on and on, singing the song of our suffering with our psyche asleep. 
If we have our psyche awake, we will know that the problem we have with our boyfriend or girlfriend, the problems we're having at work, the difficulties with our family, the problems with money, our ordeals that our being is giving us in order to make us a diamond soul. Our problems are not accidental. They are karmic. And when we take this path, the being organizes that karma and gives us the ordeals so that we can overcome them. And in the overcoming, we become pure. We conquer, not complain. Can you imagine the king seeing the battle and the threat to his kingdom takes his most precious knight, his son, his daughter, and says, here's all the armor, here's sword, all my precious things that will protect your life and save you. Go out to the battle now. And the, guy, and the son or daughter says, but it's bloody and hard out there. It's too hot. There's too many mosquitoes. And all those people are trying to kill me. That's what we do. Every day when we're moaning and crying, please, God, take me out of this problem. Please, God, give me a little more money. We are the complaining night. We need to instead be eager for the battle because each battle that we win is a step closer to divinity, a step closer to purity. The Vajra is the weapon in the hand of Zeus and Indra, the thunderbolt. The night is that thunderbolt, the embodiment of it. When God needs to do something, he sends his avatar. He sends his advocate, his representative. He sends his son, his daughter. He sends his soul. You are that. Your being has sent you to do something. You are his Vajra. But only in potentiality. Because you are not impenetrable, unconquerable yet. So this is represented in the Greek mysteries by Zeus, who represents that upper trinity. Zeus, the father of the gods, also called Jupiter, or Iopatar, who sends his lightning bolt into the world in order to perform his works. That lightning bolt is us. And you can see it traced on the tree like lightning. The rune Sig. If you've studied Richard Wagner and the ring of the Nibelungen, this is Siegfried. The one who goes down in order to forge the weapon. The great warrior who must slay the dragon. The Sig. That's us. So you see the Vajra has this shape of a thunderbolt, a rune sig. And you see in that shape something very interesting. It is three bars, right? A sig, the lightning bolt, has three parts. Those three parts are the three parts of the upper trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Kater, Hokma, Bina. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. The power of divinity expressed into the world is the Rune Sig. That is what we should become, the Vajra. And that's work done in three stages, three processes. The first is through the creation of the soul. In all the different mythologies and religions, we find Jesus was in the earth he died and went into the earth for three days. We find the three mountains. We find the three days in, amongst the Masons. These three days symbolize three stages of work in order to create a diamond soul. The first stage, the first day, is the second birth in which the soul is created. Not the diamond soul, but the solar bodies. In the second day, the entire ego must be destroyed. The killing of the three traitors. In mythology, this is represented 
by the slaying of the dragon, the killing of the Medusa, the beheading of the Minotaur, all of those mythological symbols that represent how we conquer the ego. And on the third day, after that great death of the eye, we have a resurrection. And this is where the diamond soul is extracted from the earth. So those three stages are a long process that for most people takes many lifetimes. It is possible for someone who has incredible willpower to do it in a single life. But this is very rare. Most people can't take that much struggle, that much battle and warfare, psychologically speaking. Most of us are simply too weak. We are not really Vajra with that type of strength. Nevertheless, we can do it, even if it takes us longer. So in order for this to happen, for these three stages to be realized, our being is the one who manages the steps of our path. Our being needs us to become a diamond soul. So our being organizes our karma, organizes our life, puts us where we are, dealing with what we're dealing with. The sooner we accept that and learn to start transforming that, the sooner we can start marching on the path. The being also provides us with everything we need to accomplish it. The teaching, which all of us now have. The energy, which all of us have. And the ordeals, which all of us have. That is enough. Many complain, oh, I don't have a good teacher, or oh, I don't have a wife or a husband, or I don't have a school, or I don't have a car. These are excuses. If you really look at, with opened eyes, the truth about your situation in life, you will realize you are, in fact, in a battlefield, and you are, in fact, facing death. Not just physical death, but the end of this race. And the last chance for us to be born in physical bodies and do this work. And if you, with opened eyes of the psyche, the soul, really look at that, you will realize you have no time for stupid TV shows and dumb distractions. That you must work hard, meditate, change. But we're all so asleep. We have so many habits and patterns. We think we have all the time in the world and we are so mistaken. One key thing that the being provides to us that Zeus, our innermost, our inner being, our inner father provides is fire. It is fire that is the very energy that gives us the capacity to craft our weapons. How does a smith work in a forge to create the armor, to create the sword, to create the shield and helmet? It's fire and the knowledge of metalwork. That is alchemy. That is tantra, to know how to work in the forge. And that's explained in all the books that we have and the many courses that we have. What we want to address specifically is the fire itself. In the Greek mysteries, that fire is called Hephaestus. The Romans called him Vulcan. You can also call him Lucifer. The carrier of the light is what Lucifer means. The bearer of fire. In the Greek mysteries, we find that Zeus and Hera had a son, one of many. Of course, being symbolic, this son, Hephaestus, was very tiny. And because of his very small size, Zeus cast him from heaven. And Hephaestus fell for nine days and nine nights. And when he finally landed, 
He then established his forge, his workshop, and began to work. Those nine days and nine nights represent the nine superior worlds and the nine inferior worlds. And when he reached the lowest one, he is in the ninth sphere, the heart of the earth, the deepest level of ourselves, which is where our root fire, the fire of life, burns. That ninth sphere is Yasod, sex. Hephaestus is our sexual fire. It is the fire in our heart, in our lungs, in our brain, in our veins. It is the fire of being alive. As a god, Hephaestus is the god of fire, volcanoes, and smithing, and all manners of arts and crafts. And there's a beautiful quote that I put here, and I only want to read you the end of it. It says, it's a prayer to Hephaestus, and the very end says, Preserve our nature's vital flame. What is the vital flame of our nature? It is our sexual force. It is what allows us to create life and sustain life, not just physically, but spiritually. So Hephaestus is the one who is that fire. And who gave that fire to mankind? Prometheus. We've learned a lot about Prometheus, Lucifer. This is the same symbol. Hephaestus is the fire itself that Prometheus gave to humanity. Now, it's interesting that Hephaestus was called upon to perform many tasks to create armor and weapons, to create crafts. He's the one who taught mankind all of their skills. And this is symbolic of how we ourselves learn through the fires of divinity. If you want real comprehension, real understanding, you will find that inside, through the inner fire that you have, by learning to work with that. But one task specifically that Hephaestus performed was that he went up and helped Zeus give birth to Athena. The one who split the head of Zeus and Athena burst out was Hephaestus. The fire brought about Athena, the goddess. So she is a product of his work. Athena in the Greek mysteries is the goddess of wisdom and warfare. She is the one who moves everything on the chessboard. She is Zeus's will. She is his active agent. And we find the same thing in the Hindu and Buddhist mysteries, how the goddesses are the ones who make things happen. And this is symbolic of forces in ourselves. Athena represents how the fire of Hephaestus awakens and becomes activated in a divine form. That is what we call kundalini. Athena is that. She is the goddess of warfare against our ego. The kundalini is that. It is the flaming sword in the hand of the angel. Kundalini, the burning fire of Hephaestus, the sword that was forged in the ninth sphere, delivered through the hands of Athena into her advocates, the heroes, Perseus, Theseus, Jason, Odysseus, all of whom... She guided. So this beautiful prayer to her says, Gymnastic virgin of terrific mind, dire gorgon's bane, unmarried, blessed, kind, mother of arts, impetuous, understood as fury by the bad, but wisdom by the good. Female and male, the arts of war are thine, O much formed Drakaina, which means she dragon. You might be able to tell that Athena is my favorite amongst all the Greek symbols since I was a child. So Athena is a she-dragon. Did you know that? Not just a goddess, a dragon. And you can see this in all the ancient representations of her. She always has serpents. 
The serpent is her advocate, her symbol. And of course, we know that is the serpent of Kundalini. When Jesus said, be ye as wise as serpents, he's talking about Athena, the goddess of wisdom, the Kundalini, which we must awaken. Athena is the one who provides the wisdom to create the weapons. She's the one who guides Hephaestus to provide weapons to her agents because she must conquer her antithesis, who is Medusa. It states in the Greek mysteries that there were three Gorgons, three sisters. Medusa was a beautiful virgin whose hair was her chief glory. But as she dared to vie in beauty with Athena, the goddess deprived her of her charms and changed her beautiful ringlets into hissing serpents. She became a cruel monster of so frightful an aspect that no living thing could behold her without being turned into stone. All around the cavern where she dwelt might be seen the stony figures of men and animals which had chanced to catch a glimpse of her and had been petrified with the sight. This is not a literal story. It is a teaching story. So here we see two great antitheses. Athena, the upright serpent of wisdom, the goddess of war, and her opposite, Medusa, the gorgon, the same fire, but polarized negatively as three. Remember the sig has three parts? That lightning bolt, the fire. Athena is the feminine aspect of that upper trinity. She is three. And when that fire inverts, it is also three, the Gorgon sisters, the three traitors. Medusa represents our ego. And you see, she's also covered with serpents, but negative serpents. And this polarity of serpents, you will find in the Bible, in the book of Numbers, chapter 21. Two kinds of serpents, those who poison and kill the Israelites, and the one that heals them. That one that heals them is a serpent of brass that Moses raised on a staff. So Medusa was once a beautiful virgin whose hair was her chief glory. Do you remember me telling you about that? Just a few minutes ago, were you guys all asleep at that time? Do you remember Psyche, the beautiful virgin whose beauty was her chief virtue, who was punished by the goddess of love and made a slave. Psyche is Medusa. It's the same thing. Why can't we see it? Psyche becomes Medusa. Punished. Her beauty transformed into serpents. Harmful serpents. The ego. She becomes a monster. That is what our psyche has become, monstrous, full of vanity and pride and anger and resentment. And she becomes such a cruel monster that all living things turn to stone when they see her. What does that mean? Stone is something crystallized, hardened. And what are our habits but that? Do you, have you ever tried to break a habit? Like a bad habit? Anybody here trying to lose a little weight? Or trying to not watch certain things or do certain things? Those are formations of stone in your mind. Which were created by your Medusa, your Gorgon. That is how we transform impressions. And those impressions become desires. And they become crystallized habits. And our mind is full of that. That's what this represents. Now, interestingly, the word Medusa actually means guardian. Protectress. And some of you might think, what? But she's the ego. Yeah, but if you've read The Perfect Matrimony or the book Revolution of Beelzebub, or you study the Rosicrucians, you know about the guardian of the threshold. That is the ego. She is the one who jealously 
protects her desires, her lust, her envy, her greed, and has many excuses and many explanations. She is the three traitors. She takes the forces of divinity, the fires of Hephaestus, all the energy that enlivens us in our heart, in our mind, in our body, and then we use that for our desire and our inner pilot, P-I-L-A-T-E, from the Bible, says, well, I didn't have anything to do with that, washes our hands of it, justifies our behaviors, says, well, I'm a Gnostic. I need to look at that lustful stuff so that I can overcome it. This is Pilate. Or we use that energy to gossip about someone, to say negative and harmful things about someone, and our inner Caiaphas says, it's their karma, they deserve it. Our inner Caiaphas justifies our lust and says, God gave me this energy, I have to use it. God says, be fruitful and multiply. This is Caiaphas, our evil will. And Judas, the demon of desire, will do any sin in order to gain what he wants, the silver of materialism. He will lie. He will cheat. He will betray his innermost. That is our ego. That is Medusa. So these three traitors are in all of us. The demon of desire, the demon of the mind, and the demon of evil will. In order for us to become a diamond soul, these three egos, these three traitors, rather, have to be eliminated. In the next image, we see the three Gorgon sisters. And next to them is the hero, Perseus, who kills Medusa. Now, these three traitors are in our mind. They are not outside of us. To really work in this path, we have to really get to know them and be constantly vigilant about their activities and how they work. The demon of desire is always trying to seduce us with desires, especially sexual. Always trying to get what it wants. All types of desires. The demon of the mind justifies that. Always says, well, I deserve it. I've worked so long. I've worked so hard. I've suffered so much. I deserve to have this thing or that thing. Or I deserve to have that praise or that acceptance or that status. Whatever it is that the desire wants. And the demon of evil will wants it, does it, no matter what harm it does to anyone, including ourselves. The demon of evil will just wants it done at any cost and will betray even Christ. So to rectify all this, we find in the Greek mythology, in order for Athena to conquer her antithesis, we find the birth of of Danae. Danae was a daughter born to Acrisios. And while Acrisios was making an inquiry, an oracular inquiry into the problem of him not having any sons, the God informed him that a son born of his daughter would slay him. So in fear, Acrisios constructed a bronze chamber beneath the earth where he kept the virgin Danae under guard. But Zeus snuck in and impregnated her. He appeared as a stream of gold through the ceiling that came down into her womb and made her pregnant. And when Acrisios later learned that she had given birth to Perseus, not believing that Zeus seduced her, he cast his daughter out to sea with her son on an ark. The ark drifted ashore at Seriphos, where Dictus recovered the child and brought him up. Doesn't this sound like the Bible? Doesn't this sound like the immaculate conception of Jesus combined with the birth of Moses put into an ark and put into the river? It's because all of those symbols teach the same thing. They're teaching about the soul. Danai is a symbol of our divine mother, an aspect of our innermost, an aspect of Athena. 
And Zeus impregnates her in a pure fashion, without lust, without animality. He puts a stream or particles of gold. I've been talking about the solar bodies, right? Golden bodies. The gold is seen as a precious metal taken from the earth. That stream of gold is a metal of fire. Gold is fiery. When you look at it, it's a fiery metal. So that transformed fire, that gold, that pure metal, is what impregnates Danai, the Divine Mother, the Virgin. It's the Virgin Mary, same thing. But when the king finds out, he's so afraid that he has her put into a bronze chamber. So who's this king? What king is so afraid of being killed? Who is the king over us? Satan, our ego. Isn't it true? That bronze chamber is a symbol of alchemy. How do you make bronze? You combine copper and tin, masculine and feminine, in purity. That's what you make bronze from. That's why the serpent of Moses was a serpent of bronze. That's why this chamber in the earth is a chamber of bronze. That earth is our body. That chamber is the womb of the spinal column where we combine the forces, male and female impurity, in order to give birth to Perseus. That is the second birth. Perseus is the soul that's being born. So then Perseus is put into the ark what does art come from? Arcanum, a secret, a mystery. That's these teachings. Into the sea, into the Shamaim, the waters of Genesis, in order for that ark, like Noah and Moses, to pass through the 40 days and 40 nights so that life can begin anew. That life, of course, is Theseus, or Perseus, rather. So here we see in the next image, Perseus, fully armored. When he's grown and receives his arms, he goes to kill Medusa in the myth. So this statement says, before Perseus went to kill the Gorgon, Athena gave him her shield. Hermes lent him his winged shoes. Hephaestus gave him a diamond sword. Thus armed, Perseus approached Medusa while she slept and taking care not to look directly at her, but guided by her image reflected in the bright shield which he bore, he cut off her head, from which sprang Pegasus and Creosaur. Creosaur. So that myth is very beautiful and hides the whole teaching. What we see here, Athena gave her shield to him. Athena's shield represents his own mind, his mental body. The shield is polished like a mirror, so pure that he can reflect the image of the Medusa and not be turned into stone. This represents how, through the power of meditation, we can study the ego and not be seduced by it, not fall victim to it, not be tempted by it, but overcome it. Hermes gave him his winged shoes, Hermes, of course, is Mercury. We gave a lecture about that recently. The winged shoes are how we walk the path. Moreover, we fly. Those winged shoes represent alchemy, the transmutation of the Mercury. And Hephaestus gave him a diamond sword. This is the Vajra sword. This is ready with the Kundalini, the fire that is formed and ready to cut. That is the fire in the spinal column, which as it rises up, forms a flaming sword. So armed in this way, Perseus approached Medusa while she slept. What does that mean? This is how we study the ego. The thing about the ego is, as much power as it has over us, it is very predictable. It is completely mechanical. When you look at anger, anger always wants to fulfill its anger. Anger doesn't want peace. Anger wants conflict. 
Knowing this, it makes the anger an easy enemy to overcome if you simply have the will to do it. Studying lust in the same way. Lust never wants chastity. Lust always wants to fulfill its desire. And knowing that, you know its mechanical nature. Therefore, it is a sleep. It is a mechanical behavior. It is predictable. You can approach it from behind and kill it if you know how. So he also took care not to look directly at her and was guided by the image reflected in his shield. That, of course, is meditation. That is how we see the predictable nature of the ego and are able to overcome it. We need that power. Without the shield, you cannot kill her. It's impossible. And that's why in our tradition, in all genuine traditions, meditation is emphasized again and again and again. It is the shield that protects you from Medusa. If you do not have that shield, she will turn you to stone. And great warriors and fighters fill her caverns, turn to stone. Only one kills her. And that is the one that's properly armed. So we need to learn that. When he cuts her head off, Pegasus emerges. Pegasus is, of course, a divine horse. Nowadays, we think of Pegasus with wings, but in the past, it wasn't so. The wings were added in the Romantic period, Middle Ages and such. Originally, Pegasus was simply a beautiful, pure horse, a four-legged animal. Physical body, vital body, astral body, mental body, perfect. When the ego dies, the soul is perfected. We then have this beautiful vehicle with which we can ride through all the realms of heaven. That is Pegasus, the vehicle of the soul. The one that the warrior rides on in the glory of the gods. And Chrysaur, you won't believe what that means. It means golden sword. So that represents the perfection of all that work. How the solar bodies are now perfect. Unified. This is a Vajrasattva. So that process is a process of fire and transformation. It is a long process. I wish it was easy as that short paragraph that describes the death of Medusa, but it isn't. It's actually an epic. It's a process of transforming our vices into virtues. Pride must become faith. Avarice must become altruism, etc. How do we do that? This is not just an idea or a concept or something to wish for. This tradition is growing rapidly. There are millions of students that study these teachings. And there are many who long to have the solar bodies and talk and talk about astral projection and talk and talk about the masters and the gods. But how many of them can say with authority that they have killed an ego and that that devil gave birth to a virtue. How many can say that with conviction? Not only with conviction, but with humility. Because there are many who claim it with pride. Claiming boastfully that they've eliminated this ego and that ego. But how many have actually transformed an ego of anger into love and experienced that? and not gone backwards. That is the work. We need the solar bodies, yes, but that is not the work. The work is to eliminate Medusa. The work is to kill the ego. To completely do it, 100%, you must have the solar bodies. But that doesn't mean you have to wait to have the solar bodies to get started. The solar bodies are only created in a marriage. That's in chastity. That's performing alchemy. And that process doesn't have to take long. It can be done in previous lives as well. Solar bodies are immortal. So they aren't the point. They are important. They're needed at advanced stages of the work against Medusa. 
But we can start working on our own Medusa today, no matter what our armaments are. Because all of us have the essence. And all of us can learn to meditate. And all of us have the fire of Hephaestus that we can use to direct against that ego. That weapon we have, that is our inner Athena, who is armed with a sword, a shield, a spear. And as we meditate and meditate, whether single or a couple, whether with solar bodies or without solar bodies, if we meditate and meditate on our lust, the instant that lust is fully understood in us and we extract our soul from it, she will kill it. That instant. We don't even have to ask her because that's what she wants. She wants to liberate us. She's not distracted off doing the dishes. She is right here with you all the time, watching every single movement you make, physically, emotionally, mentally. And the very instant you have comprehended an ego, she will kill it, as long as she has the fire to do it. As long as you have that fire in you, she will do it. That instant. You don't need to think, oh, I comprehended it and I forgot to ask for elimination. Tomorrow I'll meditate and ask. You don't need to do that. She will do it. It's all she wants is to liberate you from these vices. So our part is to work on them. In every experience that we have, throughout the day and night, to be watching for our three traitors and how they use these elements to manipulate us. And then when we see that mechanicity and we see that predictability and we see, oh, I see this anger that's coming up because of what somebody said, that's a demon. And my demon of desire and my demon of ill will and my demon of the mind are all taking advantage of that anger to manipulate me. So you have to step back from that and meditate on that, not react with anger, but instead see how that really should be love. Instead of feeling anger, you should be feeling love towards the other person. And that sort of transformation and a lot of meditation can reach you, bring you that transformation. So after the Medusa is killed, there's another story in the tradition of Perseus that I'll read to you quickly. This image shows Perseus at the seashore, and he's facing a great sea monster, and there's a woman embracing him. So I'm going to tell you this quick story. Arriving in Ethiopia, which Cepheus ruled, Perseus came upon his daughter Andromeda, laid out as a meal for Akitos, a sea monster. It seems that the king's wife, Cassiopeia, had challenged the Nereids in beauty, boasting that she outdid them all. Do we see the same theme here about beauty and appearances and materialism? As a result, the Nereids were in a rage, and Poseidon, in sympathetic anger, sent a flood tide upon the land. Have you ever heard of a flood before in Scripture? A flood that comes in to wipe out the impure? Yeah, same story. And a sea monster as well. The oracle of Ammon prophesied an end to the trouble if Cassiope, Cassiopeia's daughter Andromeda were served up to the monster as a meal. So Cepheus, pushed to it by the Ethiopians, tied his daughter out on a rock. And when Perseus saw her, it was love at first sight, and he promised to kill the sea monster and rescue the girl in return for her hand in marriage. Oaths were sworn, after which Perseus faced and slew the monster and set Andromeda free. So here we have yet another Beautiful mythological representation of how the warrior has to kill the monster. And the whole thing is caused because of vanity, because of pride, because of ego. And the daughter, Andromeda, is the soul, the divine soul, Gebra. She is Guinevere. She is the maiden who's being threatened by the dragon. She is Helen of Troy. She is those symbolic representations of our own divine consciousness who is threatened to be devoured by the sea monster, who in the Bible is called Leviathan. 
Do we not see that these are the same archetypes that are in every religion? And all of them represent our mind, our soul. Here, Perseus is Tiferet, our willpower, who has to conquer the ego, the sea monster, in order to liberate the soul from its bondage, Psyche, who must be brought out of slavery, bound to the rock. And when he does so, he marries her. In other words, those two souls become one. This is the alchemical wedding. This is the resurrection. This is how the monad becomes a unity. This is how we create a diamond soul. This explains the same thing. So to end this lecture, we will read a quote from Samael who says, whoever eliminates the third traitor is converted into a diamond soul. And here we see an image from Dante's Inferno where in the ninth sphere, he describes Lucifer with three mouths eating three traitors. This is a very beautiful symbol. That Lucifer is Hephaestus, Prometheus, consuming the ego in order to purify us. We always think Lucifer is a bad thing, but here we see Lucifer is what's creating our liberation, destroying the ego, consuming the three traitors. So do you have questions? Right. What I was explaining about the lunar bodies is that they belong to nature. They are created by nature and will return to nature. They aren't immortal. The solar bodies are made by the highest aspect of our inner divinity. So we say that they are Christic. That's what I mean by the solar bodies are created by God. The lunar bodies are created by nature. We need them. All creatures have them. But those bodies don't go to heaven. Yeah, they're necessary. But nature will eat them. You don't want to be in them when nature eats them, when nature takes them back. So in order for us to escape the mechanical repetitions of nature, we need bodies that escape the wheel, and those are the solar bodies. Consciousness, soul, essence, and psyche, are they interchangeable? Yes and no. In the same way, we could say that they are all mind, but we understand mind in the wrong way. We understand the word soul in the wrong way. We understand the word consciousness in the wrong way. The whole tree of life is mind. The whole tree of life is soul. The whole tree of life is psyche. It is consciousness. All of it. But when we get into the specifics of practically speaking, how do we transform our situation now? We need to get more detailed. The consciousness that we have right now is the essence, which is a portion of psyche. So in that sense, we can say they are similar. On the tree of life, when we talk about consciousness, we talk about Gebra. That's the divine soul, the woman that the knight must marry. These are symbols right? That consciousness is not consciousness in the sense that we normally think of it. In Sanskrit, it's called buddhi, which is usually translated as intellect. But that also is not accurate in English. What Gebra is, as the divine soul, it's like a, a crystal vessel that holds light. And the light that's in it is the light that comes from above. And that crystal vessel is then placed inside of other vessels to receive light back. So there's an exchange of forces. That vessel in the middle is what allows that back and forth of energies to occur. The reason I put it to you in that way is because this aspect of our psyche has a very specific function. 
that we currently don't access at all because we're asleep and because we don't know how to really meditate. When you really learn meditation and you learn to be awake, this aspect of your psyche is activated. And that's what allows you to perceive divinity. So that is consciousness in the divine sense. Ask me that question in another way. I'll just try again. Go through the question again for me. So when we talk about the different levels of the beast, are we referring to our psychological state? Like the psychological, our psychology, or, just, or also to the inner, to the levels of the inner being of our inner God? Okay, this is why I asked you to say it again, because the term levels of being is very complex. So I'm trying to figure out exactly which part you're pointing at. The word level of being, simple definition, is the entire tree of life is a map of levels of being. Yeah? So we're here physically in the physical world, and there are many other levels to nature. And we can say those are levels of beingness. But we here physically have our own level of being, which is the level or vibration of our consciousness specifically. And all of us are vibrating at the level of being of animals. A master, even physically, vibrates at a different level depending on how pure they are, how much ego they've eliminated. So there are levels of being mapped on the tree of life, but then there's also the level of being that we are currently vibrating at. And that's constantly changing depending on our behavior. So our inner being has different levels. The, yeah, there are many levels to the being. So that's the other part of it. So we can experience physically, this is a level of our being. This is a physical manifestation of our being. But if we awaken in the fifth dimension, in a dream, we can experience that level of our being. That doesn't mean that's our level of being. You see why it gets complicated? Yeah, so we're using that phrase level of being in different ways. It's, it's applying to dimensionality, but the main importance of that term, the most important use of it, is to describe the purity of our consciousness, the purity of our soul. Yes, the being is God. There are levels of gods. Could you clarify that? Sure. So in nature, if we look at the tree of life as a map of dimensionality in nature, we find that nature is very complex, right? So amongst all the different ways that nature is manifested and managed, there are many types of beings that manage that. So you have what we can call gods that help guide animals. And there are what we can call gods that help guide plants. So they work at those levels to help nature. And those are what we call elemental gods. There are other types of gods who have so much knowledge and wisdom that they can create a planet. We call them cosmo creators. The knowledge and wisdom and light and beauty of that type of god is much higher than a, real, a small elemental god that's helping a, a family of plants or animals. It's a much more beautiful, wise, um, radiant God. And then there are other gods that create solar systems or universes, and they are much more radiant. So those are levels of beings. Yeah? And so all those sephiroth represent that as well. Can the level of the inner being, the inner God, change through, um, through experience? Absolutely. And that's the whole purpose of why we're here. The experiences that we acquire as a soul directly affect our inner God. Our God, our innermost, is a ray of light that emerged out of the absolute 
in the beginning of the cosmic day. That's the quote that I read you at the beginning. And when that light came out, it projected into the world its essence, which descended as a ray, as a sig, a lightning bolt through the whole tree in order to take up bodies. And it began as a simple mineral and over countless ages evolved through the mineral kingdom, through the plant kingdom, through the animal kingdom, acquiring experience and knowledge, which the being is the one who's taking. The experience of materiality, the experience of energy, and it has wisdom that it's acquiring through all those experiences that we've had. That's how the being grows in stature. It learns to create a mineral. It learns to create a plant, an animal. And then now it needs to learn to create a human being, a soul, a diamond soul. That's the work that our being is trying to do through us, but we don't cooperate. So how come some monads don't meet the requirements? Some monads, yeah, this gets tricky. Some monads don't have the longing to improve. Some monads, the innermost, are content with the level that they have. And so they don't push their soul to work. So maybe they are Buddha or a, a being at a given level in nature, and they're content with that. And their soul is suffering, and they are fine with that. Because they're a god. Not all the monads push their human soul, which is us, to liberate itself and to acquire knowledge to create a diamond soul. That are more rare. But if you think about it, it all fits together. All the monads that are staying at their level, that aren't pushing their human souls, they're all fulfilling their offices in nature. They are managing the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and they're sustaining life in those levels. Without them, nature wouldn't function. So it's only a few that aspire to go higher and then give birth to worlds. It's rare. That's okay. But they still acquire experience at their level. With the suffering of the human soul? Yeah, they still acquire experience. It's just not the same as one who's acquiring it consciously. You see, when we transform experiences consciously and we're working to purify ourselves, we're comprehending, right? We're acquiring understanding. And that is knowledge that the being is acquiring. We're part of that. It sounds strange, but that's how it works. <laughs> She's stumped now. I'll come back. You have another question. Uh, One here. Um, you said how uh, those monads work. They're upholding nature. Mm. They're doing their part in nature. And how uh, nature is like the sea of life. And Medusa That's right. Yeah, I didn't get to that. There's a lot I skipped. <laughs> yeah, it's true. The three together are the guardians of that. Exactly. Question? Um, so when you, so when the human soul marries the consciousness in the spirit, that's through the initiation? First, it, it, the first symbolic form of that is with the initiation of Tiferet, related to the creation of the causal body. But the fulfillment of it is resurrection. The innermost never loses what it acquires, but the human soul can lose it. So if a human soul has reached the initiation of Tiferet, created the causal body, and, and initiated that beginning, but then falls, the human soul falls, loses everything, but the monad retains it. So if the human soul then wants to try again, is brought back to the path, that human soul has to recapitulate all of those processes, but it's harder. There's more karma. Certain aspects are easier because they've already done it. So there's a kind of intuitive ease, but the difficulty is worse because of the karma of having betrayed the gods. Yeah, the exp human, yes. Human soul experience. 
Yes, there's a difference in the knowledge of the being between the knowledge of the human soul. The human soul is related with tifrit, which is what we call the causal body. And this is a type of mind that we call abstract mind. This is a type of mind that is able to conceptualize in what we would call an abstract way, but it is still related to the realms of form in these lower aspects. So we're able to comprehend certain things here. And someone who's developed the causal body and therefore has developed the ability to meditate to some degree is able to comprehend to a certain depth. And that provides them with knowledge and wisdom. But that knowledge and wisdom belongs to God and is only given to the human soul according to the need. The, human, the, the innermost has much more knowledge, much more depth, much more range than the human soul has access to because they are still separated. The type of knowledge that the innermost has is related with the superior levels, is related with absolute, with the absolute. And this is a type of knowledge that's incomprehensible to Tiferet. So only when all of these parts become fully united, which is related with the initiation of Bina and resurrection, is all of that knowledge combined. And then that being becomes a diamond soul at the first level of Nirmanakaya. And that's a being of incredible beauty. It's a perfect soul, but it isn't done. Because even at that level, that, in, that being has to work harder in order to achieve the next level, Sambhogakaya. And then beyond that, Dharmakaya. And then even beyond that, more levels of objective reasoning, which is more knowledge. It's more subtle. It's deeper. He gains types of knowledge that we can't perceive yet. We, the being puts us in ordeals and difficulties in order for us to transform those, to learn about virtue, to learn about the capacities of the consciousness. So when we experience a situation that stimulates our anger and we successfully extract ourselves from that anger and are able to respond with love, there is a blossoming of knowledge that happens there that the human soul benefits from because there's comprehension. But the being benefits more because the being acquires knowledge from that that adds beauty to the being. The being becomes more resplendent. So it's like that with each ordeal. Every time you face an ordeal and you transform that ordeal and you overcome it and you express virtue, the light of that love, the light of that patience and chastity is the light that reflects the knowledge of your innermost. It's hard for the concrete mind to understand that. But it's a kind of knowledge that's abstract. It's a, it's a knowledge related with experience, not concept. The lower parts of mind, mental body, and down, works with concept. Abstract mind, which is Tifret, and above, including Gebera, is non-conceptual. It's knowledge, but non-conceptual. This, you see, this is abstract mind. This is non-conceptual intellect. The atmic body is also a type of knowledge, which in Sanskrit is called prana, which is the knowledge that sees what is beyond. What is beyond is dat, which is Hebrew for knowledge. But this knowledge is far deeper than any of the rest of it. So it just keeps going. It gets very, very subtle. A lot of hands came up. So did you have a question? Mm. Is that, I mean, even a catastrophe or a tragedy or whatever. Yeah. Um, is that a, that change is because that pain is a shock to the conscious? Yes. And, and then they just, they want to see what? Yeah, that, that when someone goes through a very painful and and traumatic type of experience, and then they change for the better after that. Some, like for example, if somebody gets really sick and nearly dies, or they get in an accident and nearly die, or they're with someone who dies suddenly, traumatically, 
these types of experiences are a very strong shock to psyche and can cause psyche to wake up. And those types of experiences are things that you never forget because it changes the soul. Because psyche itself is affected, not just the mind. So those kind of experiences are a gift from God. And they demonstrate what I'm explaining today, that God gives us ordeals. Sometimes they're very painful. We can approach death or the death of a loved one. But that wakes up psyche. So even though it hurts, it causes our spiritual eyes to suddenly realize the situation that we're in. And that longing is overwhelming longing to change and to be faithful to God. So yeah, those are shocks and we're going to get more of those. Humanity is lined up for a lot of them. So <clears throat> the thing is, it's true. We need to be aware of it and conscious of it. And what I'm trying to point out to everybody today is those things are painful. There's no question. And we wish they could be avoided, but they can't. So they're going to happen. And when they happen, Use those as a shock to your soul to wake it up and to clarify your life and how you're living it. We have to take advantage of the adversities that we have. That's what will propel us out of this abyss. A lot of, a lot of questions in the back too, I think, right? Let me get some of these. We teach the process of visualizing and imagining, asking for the elimination of an ego because it is a necessary part of the process. It's a part of comprehension. So when I say that it is not necessary, I'm saying don't get stressed out about it. Don't make yourself tense thinking that you have to mechanically and rigidly perform a certain type of practice all the time. Your divine mother is an active, awake, enlivened energy if you're working with her forces in your body. And she is there to perform that elimination at all times. But in order to really deeply work in an ego and truly comprehend it and truly eliminate it, you often find that you must meditate on it constantly. And you must visualize its destruction and asking for its elimination. This is often part of the process of comprehension. So don't just throw out that aspect of practice. Do it. But don't do any of these things mechanically. Do them with an awakened consciousness. Follow your heart. Just know that your Divine Mother is always there helping you. Another question. What is the difference between habits of the ego and habits in the personality? Are that easily just past habits from other lives? Is there a difference between egos, uh, habits of ego or habits of personality and our egotistical habits, residue of past lives. Habits of personality are more shallow. Those are habits that we develop in this existence. If we persist in strengthening them, they deepen and become more rigid and they can develop into egos and become uh, a strong affliction for us in future lives. So we have many levels of formations in the mind. Some are shallow, some are deep. Any other questions in here? Okay, that's a good question. So I explained in this lecture that creating the solar bodies is not the same thing as eliminating the ego. So even if you create the solar bodies, you still have the ego alive. Some people confuse that, and they think once you create the solar bodies, the ego is gone. This is wrong. The fact is that the initiations related to the first mountain, the first day, to create the solar bodies are a process of psychological tests. And in order to pass those tests, you need to change. Many behaviors need to change. And a certain amount of ego needs to be eliminated, reduced, or at least overcome so that they are not an affliction and they're not running your life. The end result is once you've created the solar causal body, 
That's the level of Tiferet. You have created the soul. So you have begun, you've completed that process of the work. But then you are a, at a very difficult stage because that type of person is what we call a Hasnamus. Now, the truth is, whether we have solar bodies or not, as long as we have the ego, we are Hasnamusin, all of us. The only ones who are not Hasnamusin are the resurrected masters who have completely eliminated all desire and are pure. Everybody else is a Hasnamusin. But the ones who have the solar bodies created are in a much more difficult and dangerous position because they have created immortal bodies. And if they are not very vigilant, their egos will make a mess of everything. And this is happening all over the world. These teachings are now available to the public. Many people are practicing alchemy, but not working seriously on eliminating the ego. So they are rapidly developing solar bodies, passing their ordeals at whatever speed they're passing them, but they're not working seriously on the ego. So they wind up confusing humanity. Humanity can see they have some divinity in them, and they can see the wisdom in what they're teaching, and they see the path, but they don't see the ego for what it is. And the person teaching it doesn't see their ego either because they're not working on it. So such a person is at a crossroads. If they're not very careful, they will become an abortion of nature. And the type of suffering this person will endure is really unimaginable. So we teach this openly because it's necessary. But we also strongly, repeatedly emphasize that one must work on the ego every day. Even whether you have the solar bodies or not is irrelevant. We need them, but what we need more is the elimination of the ego. Someone who eliminates the whole ego is the only one who's not a Hasnamusim. Everybody else is. That means we're all in danger. We may have made the solar body one or another or all of them in a pre previous existence. Good for us. So what? If we have the ego alive, we're a devil. And we need to work on it. So the one thing that happens, though, is that someone who's developed one or more of these bodies in the past, as I explained earlier, certain things about the teaching will become will be more natural for them, easier. So they may move more quickly through understanding things or doing certain types of practices. They may have certain kinds of experiences more easily. But that is a great danger to them, too, because they can be very lazy and think, oh, this is a piece of cake, and just coast along, not realizing that they're not working on their ego and they're teetering on the edge of becoming a real problem for humanity. So, more questions? Mm -hmm. so people like that, do they just keep getting reborn because they escape the wheel of underneath lives? Are people like that reborn because they've escaped the, the wheel? People like that come under the jurisdiction of much tougher laws. So for all of us who are beginners, the laws that manage the path and nature are more forgiving because we're like kids, we're like children. We don't really know better. But someone who's reached certain levels of initiation, the law is much more severe with them, especially if they've fallen before and are trying to recuperate what they lost. The law is very severe because the law sees them and says, well, we helped you before and you betrayed us. So why would you, we believe you now? So you need to pay you know, double. You have to prove it. So it's harder. And in that context, if such a person dies, having created the solar bodies, their situation is much more complicated. It depends on how much dharma they have and what their being wants for them and what they can negotiate. If such a person does not have the dharma to pay, they will go into devolution, but they will experience suffering that is millions of times more difficult than a regular person. Because those solar bodies were not made by mechanical nature and cannot be dissolved by mechanical nature easily. So a lunar body can be dissolved quickly. A solar body cannot. So the, the prospects for such a person are truly immense to be on that edge teetering. If anyone suspects that they've created solar bodies in the past, be extremely rigorous with yourself. 
If you even have a faint suspicion that you that you're, have done some work in the past and have a body or more than one, triple, quadruple the amount of meditation you do on your ego. Don't worry about the solar bodies. Worry about the ego because it's the ego that will take you down. Solar bodies on their own cannot take you up. They cannot. Only when they're pure. So work on the ego. Question. Oh, on the left-hand path? On the left hand. What do you mean by the left-hand path? Someone who, whose purpose is to uh, gain all of, all, of the, all of these powers, but without merging back with... Okay. With the so a but person on the left-hand path cannot create the bodies. Does that answer your question? That answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible. The solar bodies are created by Christ. The forces, the, the particles of Christ. Remember when Danai was in the bronze chamber? Those golden particles are Christ, the essence of Christ, that descend into the womb of the Divine Mother for her to elaborate Perseus, who represents the soul in its completion. Those Christic atoms are not there if someone's having the orgasm if they're masturbating, if they're indulging in lust. Those Christic atoms cannot mix with lust, ever. So if someone's still engaged in lustful behavior, they cannot create the soul. Christ can't do that. It's, it's impossible. It's a fantasy. And many believe they can, many so-called alchemists. But let me explain something to you about alchemy, something important. It is very easy to look like an alchemist, to talk like an alchemist, to think that you're an alchemist. But there are four conditions to actually be one. The first, to know how to abstain. The second, to know how to suffer. The third, to know how to be silent. And the fourth, to know how to die. Those four must be perfected to be an alchemist. So anyone on the left-hand path doesn't care about those four at all. They want power. They want experience. They want to become something. That's not death. The true alchemist is the one who wants to become nothing. The one who wants to completely immerse himself in the flame of divinity, to be consumed by it, so that he becomes the flame. Empty of self. Just a mirror for God. That's what a diamond soul is. The diamond is nothing without its light. If there's no light, it's not even there. It's the light that makes the diamond beautiful. And that light comes from God. And God can only go there if there's no ego. Make sense? Okay. Lots of hands. Do we have any more back here? <laughs> Is it true that everyone's psyche is complicated so no two people can follow the same path? Oh, I love that question. Is it true that everybody's psyche is so complicated that no two people can follow the same path? I love that. Hmm. Well, let us put it this way. The path is one path. There is only one way to reach the absolute. And it is the same way for every existing particle in the universe. There is one path but one must walk it according to one's own karma and your karma is your own. So your path will look like no one else's. So we cannot say, some people say everybody who's working in the second serpent related to the vital body has to be put in prison because that's what happened to such and such a person. So all you students, you know, get ready so that when you get to the second serpent, you're going to go to jail. So inform your family. That is ridiculous. It doesn't work like that. But many people foolishly read the things literally and think that's what it means. It does not. Every one of us walks the path according to our karma. The path is one. But we make it with our own steps. And our steps are based on our own ego, our own karma, our own problems, our own mistakes. My anger is not the same as your anger. I have to work on my anger. So if you're giving me advice about anger, that's your anger. Mine doesn't work like that. I have to work on mine and see mine and eliminate mine. So my path, 
my comprehension, my understanding, my ordeals will look nothing like yours. Nothing. Even though we have to walk the same way. Another question? Can, I, can we explain Pratyeka Buddhas in relation with this topic? The word Pratyeka means solitary. Buddha means awakened one. The Pratyeka Buddha is described as someone who's on the spiral path. Someone who is, has, is going to work on creating the solar bodies and work on eliminating the ego, but very slowly. They don't take the direct path. That decision is made once someone is working in the process of the causal body related to Tiferet. The Pratyeka Buddha is one who passes through that initiation and decides not to take the direct path to the absolute. In other words, not to do the rest of the work right now. They want to do it slowly through many incarnations. That's a Pratyeka Buddha. Some of the principles still apply, but a Pratyeka Buddha does not resurrect. A Pratyeka Buddha does not become a diamond soul. And cannot. A Pratyeka Buddha does not become a Nirmanakaya, a Sambhogakaya, or a Dharmakaya. And cannot. The heights of the path are achieved only through resurrection in Bina. And resurrection is only achieved by those on the direct path, which is the path of the Bodhisattva. That means only those who take the direct path can eliminate the entirety of the ego, die, and resurrect as embodiments of Christ. Pratyeka Buddhas cannot. So if a Pratyeka wants to achieve those heights, they have to renounce the spiral path and enter the straight path. Whose choice is it in reality to make the decision between the spiral path and the direct path? So the choice between the spiral and direct path should be the choice of the being. But many who have different types of destiny may in, intuitively or impulsively make that choice as Samael and Bior did, which he wrote about. At the same time, there are those who have so much um, fear or pride or other qualities as a ego that reach that point and impulsively choose the wrong decision. Their being may want them to go one way and they may choose the other way because of an impulse in the ego. So the decision should be the being's. But who makes it? I don't know. Depends on when you get there. The, 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 the choice is, is carried out through your action. No, the choice is made while facing an initiator in the internal worlds. And once your choice is made, it is made. Whether you succeed or not, that's, that's up to you. You receive your reward or your punishment according to what you do. That's a great question. So I explained earlier people who have created bodies but are not working seriously on the ego. So is there a difference between them and Pratyeka Buddhas? No, they're the same ones. How do you get to nirvana? They're in nirvana. Once you've reached the creation of the mental body, you've passed that fourth initiation of fire, you've established the being as a Buddha, which gives you access to nirvana. The being. The soul experiences that according to their karma and according to their work. So beyond that, in Tiferet, there are additional levels of consciousness of heaven that one can access and experience, and the being radiates at those levels or vibrates at those levels. So those are nirvanic planes. These are pratyekas, shravakas and pratyekas, different types of Buddhas. So they are hasnamusam. Yeah. Is there anything in the back? If we came early to the teachings, is it a sign that we did work before? No. It's not a sign of anything. Your terrestrial age is completely irrelevant. You came to the teachings at the moment your being decided to put you in it. And that's according to your karma. Some of us who are older wish we had gotten into it when we were younger because we would have been able to do so many things differently, but that's all the ego talking. 
When we arrive at the path and the path is delivered to us, that is the being giving it to you at exactly that moment for exactly his reasons. So we should be grateful and not look back. Take it and go. Take it and work. Another question? Good question. So if the solar bodies are created by the Christic atoms, how is it there are black magicians who are able to be awake in the inner dimensions or use the gen state? These are two separate things. Any one of us can work with the gen state, whether we have solar bodies or not. Anyone. Any one of us can learn to awaken consciousness, whether physically or in the fourth dimension or fifth dimension, because we have consciousness and we have vessels that correspond to those levels in nature. So it's very easy to awaken consciousness as a black magician, as a witch, a sorcerer. Simple. And there are many doing it. This is nothing spectacular. It's like a parlor trick. Because all you have to do is stimulate those desires and take advantage of those energies. And then you awaken. Then you can have all these powers and manipulate people and you know, fulfill your desires and do whatever you want. But ultimately, what you gain from that is karma. Christ is not the one who facilitates that. It's energy who does it. We can use energy in whichever way we want. Energy is just a force in nature. So that's the fire of Hephaestus, which is in all things. Sorcerers and witches and black magicians use that energy to feed their desires. That's why we always see those pictures of hell full of fire, right? That's Hephaestus who's being used by those entities in order to fulfill what they want. Creating the solar bodies is something completely different. The solar bodies are only possible in an environment of chastity. And they are created according to very strict guidelines under the guidance of specialists who direct the, the pure energies in order to create those bodies. It's a very delicate work. It's a very slow process. And what is made from it is immortal. No black magician can come near that. No black magician is an immortal except those who have fallen as angels into demons. And then they have a very bad situation so to face. Some do. Some do. Fallen angels. That's what we call a, quote, fallen angel. It's someone who's created the solar bodies and then decided to go down. They were a Hasnamusin. They didn't eliminate their ego. The ego takes over. The being says, I see that my soul here is not listening. The soul, I've given the soul the bodies. I've given the soul the path. I've given the soul all the opportunities. But this soul is addicted to lust, is addicted to pride or envy. So the being says, okay, I divorce you. And that soul is cut from being. And that soul becomes a fully fledged devil, a demon, awake with powers of the solar bodies, able to travel in all the dimensions, but using those powers for evil. Now, the being takes back all of its elements from that soul. The being holds everything. The being doesn't let that devil misuse what belongs to the being. That's the solar bodies themselves. But the capacities of that consciousness that's trapped in the ego are much different from an average soul because it's awakened and it's very devious that type of soul here's the thing this is the tricky part so listen carefully a soul like that who created the solar bodies and then fell can trick you so easily because they know the path they know chastity they know sanctity they know sacrifice they know everything that we're teaching here and they'll talk about it and explain it and very beautifully explain and talk about these things and think, and you will think they are a master because they are, but they're a master in hell, but you have no way of seeing it, no way of knowing it because we're all beginners. The only way to clarify and know that is to awaken and to call upon the forces of Christ to help you perceive the truth. And that's why we learn ways of protecting ourselves. We learn prayers and conjurations and different mantras because 
most of humanity is being fooled by these types of beings right now. And many of them are so-called Gnostics. To pull more, to pull humanity into the abyss. How is their decision because if you learn gnosis improperly, you will become a devil. Samuel and Vior stated it in his book Major Mysteries. He said, "From gnosis, there's only two possible outcomes: an angel or a devil. And those who will become angels are very few. A handful. The rest will become demons. That's why some." in the Kabbalistic tradition, call Samael the father of demons. And they say, from his teachings, only devils will come. It's true. A lot of devils will come. You keep praying, praying and praying and praying and make strong effort to remember your dreams and experiences in meditation. It's the only way to get accurate guidance. Constant, constant prayer. And really be very disciplined about recording your dreams and meditating and then remembering what you learned in your meditation. And the thing is, the teachings that you gain from that are teachings from your being. They're better than what I can give you. They're better than any teacher can give you. So they're teachings from yourself to you, your innermost. But they're always symbolic. That's why we have to study Kabbalah. We have to study mythology. Because these myths, these stories and archetypes show us how to interpret symbols. Can you that repeating? If it's repeating, then you need, haven't comprehended it. If it's repeating, it's your being saying, hello, 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 <laughs> hello, hello, right? It's your God saying, I need you to listen to me. I'm telling you something. You need to get it. So you need to meditate on that symbol. Repeating dreams, repeating dreams, there's something there that you need to figure out. Yeah? Thank you. We'll end there. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,